Hello, Kevin. This is Mark Farrar with Not Square Design in Butte, Montana. And I'm um, working on that juicy vapor that's out in Rocker, where you sell vaping supplies. And my goodness, you guys have a huge selection of juices. So, um, anyway, what I want to do is I've, I've got an email that I've started here, and then below it this is the cut and paste i'm just going to drag over my uh, one note and go through it there but i just want to let you know that you know calling it's a report summary because you know a true feasibility study um which is a you know is this possible um from a, a code standpoint from a practical standpoint um, you've got a lot of input on whether it's practical for or feasible from a uh, financial standpoint. Um, then there's also the life safety report. Uh, we could do that instead. I don't know that that is really necessary in this case. Um, it may become so. We'll, to, we'll discuss that as we go along. So um, I just. Uh, Want to bring this over and let's run through it real quick and let me get some pictures up in case I need to look at anything right off the bat and let's make sure that we open one and get it positioned correctly so I can bounce back and forth if I need to so um, I guess that's just the back of your story <laughs> Oh, there's a video. That's a video. There we go. Um, it's probably better than showing your back office. So uh, that's sitting there. And I guess I can just use this to switch back and forth. So anyway, um, let's scroll up to the top and I'm gonna highlight it. And basically these just list out um, when you see the photos I put you in Dropbox for you. Um, this is the name of the series. So it's it's this 01, then it's 02, then it's 03 through 05. And then it's kind of the same deal. And this is a little description of what they are. Um, and these little titles, they're pretty self-explanatory once you understand the things that I saw down there and, and what we'll go through here. So... Um, one proper solution to keep the pipes from freezing is to actually isolate those pipes instead of just stuffing insulation everywhere. Insulation is like a thermos. So if you take a thermos and you put hot water in it and set it outside, it's going to stay hot for a while until it's just not hot anymore. Sorry, we're approaching the 4th of July here in Butte, Montana. So there might be a lot of reports, but um, so as the thermos reaches ambient temperature, it's the same temperature as the outside. So insulation just acts as a slowing of that effect. So we need to have some sort of source to keep that from happening. And one way is heat tape, but I find that to be a little less reliable and explain it better in here. But um, that's something we could talk about if, if it's, you know, we get, we got other things that, uh, that we got to deal with first. And, um, so, um, and then there's a film named, uh, phone cam crawl space. And I discussed the nails of the rim joist because this definitely indicates that there are rim joists. And so it's, if you don't want to watch the whole film, it's only five minutes, but if you, you can go to just three minutes, 32 seconds, and you'll see my explanation there. So next week, I'm gonna reach out to BSB and find out about the setbacks. So here, um, we've got a couple of options. Let's say that setbacks are really minor. There's a two foot setback and we think we can make it fit. Well, it's still pretty close that we should probably find out where that building is really located because Cadastral is super accurate. It's not what's called geosynchronized, and so it hasn't been positioned correctly with 
the the earth and so you'll notice like if you look around butte in the cadastral you're going to see that some property lines go right through somebody's house so it's not at all geosynchronized and i'm going to shut my my window i think it's beautiful out but and i'm but I've had my headphones on and it sounds like it's really picking up loud. So hopefully it wasn't too loud. But at any rate, um, cadastral is not the way to go. So we can do one or two things if we find out like, okay, it does have setbacks. There's a possibility it's going to work. They're close enough. We should find out where the building is. So one thing is, do you know where there's a property corner? Um, do I need to go back out there and look and see if I can find one? Because there's two ways to handle this. Um, if there's a property corner that's right there, the survey won't be so bad because a lot of the cost of a survey is them having to transfer a property corner from half a mile away to get to your building and then find out where you're at. Depends on what kind of equipment, but I haven't seen um, some of the really, really, really nice equipment up here um, like we had in, in Arizona because I did surveying in my company as well. But nonetheless, um, you usually have to find a corner marker. And the other option to surveying, which um, can be if there is a property corner that's right there, or something that definitively defines the property. And I mean definitively defines it enough to where we really trust it, that we're within inches. Like maybe we trust that fence is within inches. Then um, I can have a, a guy out of Missoula, Ryan Darling, and he's with Laser Verify 3D. Um, has a great scanning service, LiDAR scanning. I scans, you'll see if you go to my YouTube channel, there's a lot of stuff on there. And if you need to get there, that is, um, uh, it's, go to YouTube and then search the at symbol, not square design, three, four, six, nine, no spaces. So um, aside from that, um, you, then you can see his stuff and you can look at like the train station. There's some great scanning there. Um, but the big ones like the Peck residence, all the contour lines, um, I got all that. And we found property corners that were marked. Um, the flags were still there from the original survey when the subdivision was made. So got lucky in that regard. We actually had three. But um, I believe Ryan can even do it just one because if we know a property corner, his machine knows what direction it is. So um, that scanning can give us everything that we can possibly see. So if we had, especially if we had like the building dug out and you want to know, you want to permanently scan of what's under there, it'll be precise. I mean, really precise. So that's another option and we can discuss that in more detail. If that's something that we get to, we need to figure out kind of where we're at with the, with the actual city. If the setback's like 10 feet, then you're already in, um, in a big issue with the current design. So then maybe it becomes a process of, do we need to redesign what you want to do? Um, so your addition is under 50% of the building's current footprint. So, <laughs> I didn't even finish writing this. And so it falls under what is called an addition in the existing building code. So I'll just put an addition just so I have that. And I'm going to highlight this so that I know to come back and check it out and finish it up. So you have an existing building. And so with that, comes a lot of leniency in what we have to comply with but also there's some stuff that we may have to comply with that wasn't anticipated so um, one thought that crossed my mind was uh, given 
we learn about the setbacks and the building location within and find that the proposed addition would work out as far as a new footprint goes would be to excavate that side as if we were putting footings to see what we find. So that would mean putting up a little, foot, you know, one of those orange fences to keep people from falling in the hole. Your employees couldn't park in that spot for right now. Um, I do think we should have, we should really find out about the setbacks first. Let's, let's see if we're even in the ballpark before you decide, you know, to be excavating some area. But there should be, I mean, the way the thing is put together, you've got, um, let me see if I can pull up that one of those guys. So this beam, post and beam go up, and then you do have a king post, which is the center, the center post riser. And here we have got a big header because you have an opening below. Here you have a big header because there's nothing below. But all these should go out, down, into a footing. And that includes this one, which is really curious because it goes out, down, and that's the corner that I dug out that's just, it's, it's empty. Um, you know, this is looking straight back. So the post should be in my way in this photograph. And this photograph of, uh, is of this material back here, which to me looks like a plastic. Even when we get into some of the photos that are clearer than this one, it just, it looks like some sort of plastic, but it could be painted concrete, which means that maybe they have a central support system with these beams going across and the blue board is balancing your building. That seems unrealistic, especially out there, because it can get pretty windy. So um, I don't think that's the case, but I, I also can't see how it's built. This is not a big timber. This is a two by four right here in our view. Um, and so this insulation was just stuffed everywhere. And I'm sorry, I had to kind of make a mess and pull a bunch of it out. But it was really the only way to see and try and get to, gee, what is back there? What is that thing? And God, it's just so hard to tell. And I couldn't get under there. Um, um, got some injuries. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Um, so your drain lines aren't too subject to freezing. I mean, they'll freeze, but... Um, you know, it'd have to be cold for a very long time for that to become a tremendous issue. And uh, let's get past the video ones. You can listen to those. This looks like a supply line, but it's not. It's probably the drain from the sink. Uh, so it's a small line, and then it just comes in at 45 into um, a reducer fitting. So then along the outside, we've got all kinds of things. But this is the hole I managed to get dug. So if you look right, you know what I don't have on? Let me pause. Okay, sorry about that, but this highlighter can be useful. So um, I've got a whole bunch of nailing, a ridiculous amount of nailing. That make, doesn't make any sense because there's nothing back here. I don't even know what's going to. I put my hand all the way up inside there. You'll see that in one of the videos. Then we've got nailing here and then about every 16 inches, which is floor joist spacing. And I believe this is two by eight. Uh, I didn't measure it while I was out there, but um, looks like a two by eight to me. Um, this, is a, this is definitely a two by 12, just looking at it. So there is a possibility this is only two by six, um, but I, I hope it's a two by eight. Um, because whatever we do, wherever we affect, we're going to have to remedy and fix it. So you, this is the shot along. Uh, it's better in the video. But again, there's that, that area, that hole. And it just doesn't, doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So um, anyway, the addition is under 50% of your current building's footprint. So it is, it is going to be classified as um, an addition for the IEBC, which is the International Existing Building Code. And that's the one we're going to utilize to tell us what to do. As it is 
giving gives you some leniency. So um, some things I wanted to go through is that you know I, I put in the code um, that was pertinent to your project. So chapter eleven in the IBC is where I started because that is the chapter it's really about rendition. So um, this is the international building code but it just is a circular reference. So um, I, I put it there, it's, you know, it's a highlighted, this highlighted area in blue is what we call a code loop. It uses, it's useless in my opinion and frustrating to many in my profession as it represents the entirety of chapter six on additions. But um, I guess if you were, not starting in the international existing building code because you didn't know it existed this would get, get you there so um at any rate oh no this one is in the iebc sorry it's down down below but um so here um where an addition impacts the existing building or structure that portion shall comply with this code. So if you're gonna open that wall, um, we've got a deal there and falls into another little rule, um, which I've come across and I think I covered that down here. So we'll, yeah, it is. So we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so um, then creation or extension of non-conformity an exit an addition shall not create or extend any non-conformity with the existing building to which the addition is being made with regard to accessibility structure strength that's a big one fire safety means of egress or the capacity of mechanical or plumbing so if your mechanical systems are at a minimum um they might have to be pushed up or supplemented. Plumbing is fine, um, like it's just the overall size of the building. It's 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 gonna be fine uh, with the exception of, I didn't really check it out for, it's a uh, handicap accessibility. Um, this may push you into needing to change that to make it a handicap bathroom, but there are some minimalist sized handicap bathrooms and um, Pretty obvious that you don't have probably a high volume of traffic above uh, handicapped people just because of the dirt location and and that sort of thing. But things are changing with the you know power chairs and all that stuff. People get around pretty good. And spent some time in a wheelchair myself and uh, had a son with cerebral palsy and uh, he was a wheelchair uh, dependent. So. Um, it's creation of or extension of non-conformity is so um, what I said there was basically see my comments below other work any repair or alteration work within an existing building to which an addition is being made shall comply with the applicable requirements for the work classified in chapter 6 so this is that chapter six, which just says go to chapter 11. Um, and there is chapter two, but you know, it, chapter two is not really, I, I only want, put down stuff that was pertinent. So chapter two doesn't have to do with additions. So, um, and then there's parts of this section that are missing because they had to do with the uh, classrooms, you know, and so I kind of left that sort of stuff out. Um, so 606.1 scope, provisions for additions. And that's where it's just take us chapter two, which doesn't pertain then application chapter 11. And that's what we just went through. So here we've got the 502.4 existing structural elements carrying gravity load and I just took us to this chapter because it is to do with additions in the existing building code so um, an existing gravity load 
so that's just the vertical load from gravity. Um, carrying structural elements and these little green things. Um, I do code work for the ICC and so that, that was green too, but it's because I highlighted it. So ignore the green things. That's just to remind me that I have a change that, that to report to them. So um, for which in addition and its related alterations cause an increase in design. Oh, this should even have a problem here. An increase in design. There's an of. I'll have to evaluate that further myself, but I'm going to just remind myself to look at it. Um, dead or live or snow load, including snow drift effects, of more than 5% shall be replaced or altered as needed to carry the gravity loads required by the International Building Code for new structures. What's that saying is basically that if the addition with the roof that's going to have to be built over to get you drainage bears on the existing building, if that increases the load by more than 50% uh, or 5%, then we have to make the, that part of the structure of the existing now handle that additional load and it has to handle it in such a way as to conform with current codes and anyway change basically has to be brought up to the international building code instead of just the international existing building code so that's what it's saying yeah you know bring it up to whatever is required by the international building code for new structures so um, if we were to be able to, let's say, build a really decent foundation and put the addition on that, bring it up, and then cantilever that drainage roof over the top with a truss system that connects and is sealed so there's no leakage or anything like that, but doesn't bear weight on it, would be one way to work this around. Um, then this exception doesn't mean because it's for residential uh, so existing structural elements carrying lateral load so lateral load is basically your stack of cards um, you push on it and you don't want it to just tip over you want it to resist that and stay in place and so um, we have to evaluate it for lateral and if we get past the Thing where we say, okay, this is a viable addition. We've got the room to do what we want, or we found a new design that will fit in the bounds that we're confined in, and that you agree with that design. Whichever way it ends up going, I just don't know at this point until I get to talk to the um, building officials about um, what your setbacks are, and so we can get an idea. Um, but if that comes push comes to shove, then we will probably need to get a lateral analysis, which means we need a, a PE. And so a Montana State Registered Structural Engineer. A PE is Professional Engineer. That's the initials behind their title. Um, I went to school with Dimitri Wright from Cascade Engineering, Inc. He's in Hillsboro, but he keeps reciprocity to Montana for me. He kept reciprocity to Arizona for me when we worked down there, and we work on the tri-state area, so Washington and Oregon as well together. But, um, so yeah, so he's, uh, don't want to see in my back pocket. That's kind of insulting to him, but, um, yeah, he's, he's a great guy to work with, and uh, we use the same system, and i just get you a quote if it comes to that point. We just don't know where we're at yet. I'm just trying to prepare you for everything here. So up here, it also talks about um, referring to these two sections. So the first one is, it's a really large section. So I didn't copy it in here. Uh, really large. And, um, but it has to do with wind. 
And so that's just going to be, you know, the big bad wolf. And he's trying to destabilize your building laterally. So then there's uh, 1613, which is also quite a large section. So, of course, I didn't copy there either. But that section has to do with seismic. And that's just the rattling and shaking of your building apart or the liquefaction of whatever is underneath it um, so that your building just falls over. So that is where I go into the whole thing of, you know, what Dimitri and I did. But if you want, I've got a whole thing written up already and I just cut and paste it in an email and send it off. Just let me know you want, you're interested in knowing more about that, and I'll get that off to you right away. Um, there is a code that often comes up, and this is what I was taught, saying I'd come to um, when I was talking about the addition. So think about the way that you wanted to do things. And so let's see, concept floor plan. So here, what I see in your floor plan is this is your existing building, okay? So this is the corner that I was digging in. And you want to open this whole wall. So now we've lost all the shear for your building. Um, if it were just that. But then we tie on this nice addition. We close the loop. None of these are over 35 feet in total length. So we're going to fall with them. Prescriptive. Um, code for lateral um, right there um, and so we may not need to worry too much about it but I wanted to show you this because this is over 50% of the length of the building so I'm opening up a wall more than 50% and that's gonna make more sense when I go through this so and this is a residential code but it's just something that comes up often with my residential remodel edition projects that states that egress must be directly to the outside of any sleeping area. And the reason that is is because fire departments need to know how to get in and which windows to go into. So that's why sleeping areas always have a certain size window that is right on the outside and you don't have to get out of bed, go through a room to another room. Because then the fire department might break open that first room. Nobody's there and they move on. And so um, critical times lost. You die from smoke inhalation. And that's so no, the egress is more designed for the fire department to get in than for you to get out. So when a homeowner is considering making an interior room into a sleeping room i explain this um, sometimes there is a room with egress that opens directly into that room in order to make it into one room so that we can use that exterior egress that exists in that usually smaller room the adjoining wall must be open more than 50 percent if you open it more than 50%, it's now considered one room. Um, so it's either 50% or more. So um, I bring this up as you're opening the wall between, which I showed you, and the exist between the addition and the existing, thought I had a typo, by more than 50% of its length. Uh, I have not come across this in commercial in the past and wonder what the code will reveal um, happens to the spaces and what will be required of us. So this is just one that I haven't hit yet where in a commercial existing building, the addition was opening up a major portion, which in your case is all just one room. Um, you could call that office space in the back another room, but um, gosh, where is that? located I'm sick of memory here and i'm thinking i'm wrong yeah so the office won't even be it'll all be one room when this thing is done i don't know what your layout's going to be exactly but um you know just from the looks of it it's 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 one room and so 
you know, what what's that going to take us and require us to do? So, um, so I basically was just want to say here that I urge you not to take this up further um, with BSB until I can get answers from the code re research needed on almost all projects or ask questions of the, at, in the pre-application meeting. Some of my clients wish for me to stay quiet and see if B BSB catches it. So not knowing what the requirement is myself, it's hard for me to advise you on that. Um, so I can either do the code research or I can go into the pre-application meeting and ask them directly, hey, here's this. If you're not trying to get around anything, then that may be a great way to go if you're just trying to completely 100% comply um, because now you're an open book to them. Um, but it's, you're my client. It's completely up to you. I work for you. I don't work for BSB. I'm not obligated, nor do I feel it ethical to report you for anything that I would not consider a public safety hazard or immoral. In this case, I don't see either, um, especially knowing not knowing where we're headed yet. So that's my summary. I hope that explains it well enough, but of course, please give me a call. And again, my number is 940-654-0617. And um, let's talk about any questions you have. I did put all that stuff in Dropbox. Hopefully you've downloaded it by the time you get this. And um, we can go from there. So anyway, again, this is Mark Fro with Not Square Design, and thank you for stopping by. And if you're in the Rocker area and you vape, this is really a nice store. So I go check it out. So I will talk to you later.